Jean Gardner, who is um, a renowned um, artist, activist, professor. She is in the uh, Constructed Environments program at the New School. She's written several books that are really highly acclaimed. And I think her, her gift is really engaging community through creative um, approaches to whatever it is that you're teaching. So thank you very much for coming. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Louise. And thank all of you for coming out on this beautiful night when I'm sure I was looking for a cafe all day long to sit in, get the tables out. And as Louise said, I'm from the School of Constructed Environments, and my two research assistants are here, Jeffrey Carter and Mark Wilson, and they have been helping develop the participatory teaching and learning techniques that we're gonna to demonstrate today. And they're both graduate students in the School of Constructed Environments, but they're also both teachers in their own standing. So I want you to appreciate both of them because they've contributed and they're going to do some of the um, exercises, lead them. And you may find it curious that the School of Constructed Environments might be engaged in healing. I mean, certainly I expect it in your program, creative arts, therapy, that you'd be healing. And it may help you understand the overlap between people who build, people who construct, and yourselves when I say that our focus is on designing sustainably. So, the school, whether you're in interiors or lighting or architecture or professional program, the emphasis is on creating healing environments. And it occurred to me a number of years ago that a lot of the students who were designing these healing sustainable environments were living very unsustainably. They shredded. They didn't eat, they didn't sleep. There's even this mystique that if you stay up for 20 days, you're creative. You know, it's just, it was really crazy. How can you design a sustainable world if you yourself aren't living sustainably? So I began to switch my emphasis to the students. And what is it that we could do in the classroom, in the studios, to help them live more sustainably, and experience the kind of well-being that the world that they're trying to make is intended to do. So this, in my mind, has evolved to the point of it's not just how do we, whether you're in the healing arts, whether you're a lighting designer, what is the design going to be like, but to an emphasis on the necessity of reimagining what it means to be human. So this lately has become my focus. The human that, as we know ourselves today, is not, what can I say? <laughs> not doing it very well, let's say. Just, I don't want to be doom and gloom the first minute we start. But I think you all understand, because you're in the healing arts, that we need to expand what we think of as human. So the underlying focus for us, Jeff and Mark and myself, is this reimagining the human, and possibly that's the same in your work. So I'm going to be asking you to experience a number of the techniques that we've been developing that are all focused on one thing paying attention, being awake, that's it. So it's our hypothesis that if we were awake, we would begin to live differently. But how can you become awake in this distracted era? 
So the first thing I'm going to ask you all to do is to turn off all electronic devices, put them on the floor, throw them out the windows, not on your body anywhere. And one of the reasons is it's, it's addictive when you have an electronic device. And I only know this because I do it myself. Oh, just let me check a minute. Somebody I don't even know might have emailed me with a million dollars. And I, you know, I can't stop myself. So number one, the temptation is turned off. It's under your chair. But number two, people are starting to feel what are called uh, phantom vibrations. So you're sitting there and you're just saying, oh, she's so interesting. Oh, I got a phone call, but I don't have my phone on me. <laughs> no, this is happening, even to doctors. Doctors have started, they started the initial research on it. So your bodies are vibrating to nothing that exists. So how can we heal ourselves? How can we heal the city, our earth, our families, if we don't even feel things that are real? We feel all these phantom vibrations, messages from Mars. I don't know where they're coming from. So that's another reason, along with the fact that it's, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Electronics is terrific. but. A lot is learned face to face. And even I do it when I go to a conference. Now everybody's checking their email, writing up something. You know, so even if you're all there together, everybody's already on their devices. So I'd like everybody to stand up. First exercise we're going to do stand up, get. Make some space so you have space around you. And what we're going to be doing, you know, get so you don't knock anybody out. Because I haven't done first aid training in a long time. But the, we're going to do some stretching. And the purpose is to wake your body up at 6.30, quarter of 7. You've had a long day. If you're like me, you probably woke up around 5 or something. And your mind's probably off, oh, my pillow would be so comfortable right now. You know, or dinner, when am I going to have dinner? So we want to get our mind into our body and our body awake. So just in the beginning, just stretch you know, any way that you feel like it. But make sure you're not going to knock your neighbor out. So stretch, stretch, stretch. Ah, and then we're going to try and stretch together. So. Stretching over to the right, you're holding your hands turned upward, way over. Don't squunch the underside. Everything is to open up the ribs, the vertebrae, up straight and over. And you've got your feet, ooh, really flat on the earth. Ah, oh. If you, if you feel creaks and pains and stuff, that's great. You're waking them up. So lean back and you want to open your arms up. Whoa. Just, you know, embrace the whole world. Wow. And then, ah. Oh, yeah, noises. I love noises. Your poor voice box. And then just flop over. Oh, and swing. Woo. You remember swinging when you were a kid or when you go with your own children to the park? Swinging side to side, back and forth. And the key thing is your head is lower than your heart, that old brain is charging up with blood. And so just hang there. See if your hands can touch the floor. Maybe you can get your elbows down. Now you're loosening up that whole back that's all squunched from sitting all day long. The top part of your thighs ought to be stretching. Ooh, maybe you can sort of sit. Who needs a chair? Put your arms up. Get your legs away. Yes. Ooh, who needs a chair designer? Yes, good, yawn. That's, no, seriously, that's taking in oxygen. You need it. Now when we get up, we want to go really slowly. If your head lasts, or you might faint. Ah. <sighs> ah. You know, wake up those faces all day long. You've been pleasing people. Oh, I'm such a sweet little teacher. So now just stand and 
see how it feels. Can you feel all kinds of tinglings? That's your oxygen getting into the ends of your fingers. How far down can you feel? Through your legs, your knees, down through your feet, just through the new school, whoa, into the earth. Ah. See, you're not all by yourself. There's something larger that's supporting us. So now we're going to sit down just the way you are now and shut your eyes for a few minutes, just one minute, and take in what you experienced. And particularly be aware of where the breath is going. Is it going to the top of your head, into your throat? Where, when you breathe, does it go? And when you're ready, just very slowly open your eyes, see if you can stay in the place that you are when you open your eyes. And take your index card and just write a few words that are going to be just for yourself about the experience. Whatever, it's not, as I said, not going to be collected, not going to be talked about. So that's the basic exercise that I do at the beginning of all my classes, starting out at the beginning of the semester with a very simple few movements like we just did, and then building up over the course of the semester as the students become 
comfortable with it to more involved postures to wake up your body. And the underlying focus is to actually experience what it means to align your body and your mind and your breathing. So it's this idea of bringing these three together. Very simple, but we don't practice it very often. The structure of a classroom is such that your bodies are very likely to become dead weight sitting in a chair all day long. So the physicality of learning has completely disappeared. Whether you're sitting in an office, if you have a client, if you're a therapist, there isn't any movement involved to any degree. And at this point, neuroscience has so radicalized our idea of the mind and the body that this way of learning becomes a parody, something that historically people are going to look at the last 200 years and say, my god, what were they doing? Teaching one generation, teaching the next by having them just sit there. I always like to think, well, there's just a little hole. That's what they thought. There'd be a hole in the student's head, and then I'm the teacher. I just pour it all in there. And then you write the test. 100. In high school, I thought you could get 100 on Shakespeare. To be or not to be. You know, there was a right answer somewhere if somebody would tell it to me. I just did not get it between this disjunction of what it means to live, which is to move, and the way we were learning. So today, neuroscience has made it very clear. We think with our entire body. And when we are making, that's a fundamental form of thinking, that they're not two separate things. So this idea that we have theory and practice right away is an indication of how we separate the mind from the body. But neuroscience makes it very clear. The theory, the thought, comes after the physical, visceral experience in your body. And that the idea that we're rational beings with no emotive or value system that guides our behavior is not in anywhere in evidence in real life. People are not rational. So if we treat them as rational beings, if we don't treat them as emotional, physical beings, my premise is we'll never reach them. And they'll never wake up. And we see a lot, of, a lot of people who just are asleep on their feet. So stretching, just simple movements that are such that you can't be thinking about what you're going to do later tonight or you're going to fall over. So that's one of the nice things about stretching exercises, especially based on yoga. You can't not be in your body, and you have to be breathing obviously. So that's the way I start out when I give presentations or when I have classes. So the next thing I'd like to do is have each of you find somebody in the room, preferably that you don't know at all, and sit together. So if everybody could get up and I hope we have no wallflowers. Everybody go choose a partner, but you shouldn't know, try not to know them at all, yeah. Two people, two people, yeah. And then sit together, because we're gonna do something together. So just find somebody, preferably you don't know them. Are you in the circle, come, come. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, sit so you don't sit too close to each other because, um, I mean, too close to other people because they might overhear. So you want to move around. So you need a partner? But you two? Yeah, OK. So this, you, need, you need a partner. Hello? 
No, we would, we would like you to stay. Okay, okay, well, that's, I just want to make sure you don't feel. So everybody has a partner. All right, now what I'm going to ask you to we're gonna spend a few minutes. I want you to shake hands with each other and introduce yourselves. Wait, 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 wait. I'm not finished. <laughs> I'm so happy you're eager. Yes. And then take turns and tell the other person what your passion is. And it does not have to be coming to this class, listening to Gene Gardner. It doesn't have to anything to do with what you do professionally or you hope to do. So really, what is your passion? What gets you awake? You may have to sit a minute to remember. So shake hands, say hello to each other, what's your name, and then tell each other what your passion is.
and I offer a discount to drop it. So you don't see students, students coming in every day. Right, because mostly they don't. Mostly they don't. Right. And to, and to know that there is a few that have been so interested in how Designing a day with a classroom or a session in a way that is not. So that to me is refreshing and interesting that I no, I know I still have work to do personally. Old habits. So finish up, and when you're finished, turn and uh, sit quietly. So now I'd like you just to sit for a couple of uh, seconds, a couple of seconds, that's like saying to a child, we'll be there in a minute, <laughs> it's just miles away, about 30 seconds just to sit and then I take your card and again write a few observations about your experience. Now these don't have to be sentences, they can just be words, but the point is before we start talking about it to get your own thoughts down. So try and just sit for a second. Let it yourself recognize your experience. Then write about it before we talk about it. So this is the second of three exercises that we're going to be doing that has to do with waking up, paying attention, being mindful. So the question I'm going to ask you is, what did you learn about your partner from shaking their hand? So you might want to consider that for a little bit, write it down. Nothing that they said. What did you learn from their handshake about them?
Anybody want to venture a comment about what you learned? You may never see your partner again. <laughs> this is the last class. <laughs> yes. I wrote down gentle and kind. Gentle and kind. Gentle and kind. Yeah. Uh, warm and inviting. Warm, inviting. Does anyone else just throw it out? Yeah. Solid and present. Solid and present. Yeah. Friendly and balanced. Friendly and balanced. It's interesting that they're pairs of words. And that the, in my mind, the two words are linked. Like saying friendly. So that's leading you to the sense of the person being balanced. And what did you say again? Warm and inviting. Yeah, warm, that's a warmness. Anybody else want to? Yeah, <laughs> Louise? Oh, the same. Okay, let's say it simultaneously. Okay. <laughs> Sympathy and empathy. Oh, conscientious and considerate. Cece? Cece? Yeah. <laughs> You've got pathies, yeah. yeah. empathy yeah. and sympathy. Yeah. Um, hesitant and weary. Evident. Hesitant. Hesitant. And weary. Weary. Not weary. I know he's weary. You don't want to tell me about that, but I'm weary. <laughs> I didn't write down specific words or adjectives, mm. but I wrote down when we made notes an order, an order of information that I received, and I thought that the first thing was about energy, mm. and that came from that exchange. That you got some. Well, the I, first thing I read and the first thing I retained about this woman was an mm -hmm, energy, mm -hmm. and that came from just attending to her. Wow. So you are opening up another wonderful doorway for us. So hold that for a second, because I want to come back to it. What, um, what was communicated to you were qualities of a person, and not facts, in the sense that I can't go and you know give Jeff a weariness test. Because <laughs> what's weary or wary for anybody is different, for everybody's different. So the communication was very personal, and it has to do with qualities. So this paying attention is the underlying focus, because we want to reinvent what it means to be human. And you're expressing very clearly and articulately the qualities of your experiences. So those are highly subjective. They're connected to emotions. And this goes back to what I said earlier, that the extraordinary explosion of understanding about the human mind and how we move in the world has completely overthrown the idea that we're largely involved with facts and rational criteria. That what we get first in our body are these qualities. And they can be a people, or the chair you're sitting on, the air that we're breathing. That was part of the first exercise. Breathing the air in this room, taking in the qualities into your body. So now you expressed very clearly that underneath all these qualities is an energy, a human energy that's being communicated. And it takes on specific identification in your experience, but it's energy. It, what, was, what was the word you used? Gentle yes, yeah, so it's a gentle, kind energy that's being transferred. And we hear so much today about an energy crisis. We're running out of oil. We've got too much natural gas. 
there's a war here and a traffic jam there, and it's crazy all over energy. One of the things that isn't being talked about is where's human energy in all of this? We've got renewables, we've got unrenewables, but what about human energy? What ignites that? And what do we put out in the world for other people? So yes, you've got a passion, and I ask you to talk about it, and that's the place you hopefully are working from. You remember what it is that gives you energy. So your communication with Carol of energy, that's the prime thing that comes. And sometimes it's um, energy that pushes us away. You can feel when, I mean, we have all the instincts that animals have. And you know, people used to be able to smell aggression, smell fear. So it's my contention that if we wake ourselves up, what it means is we're, first of all, going into the body. As I mentioned in the first exercise, we're aligning ourselves with our breath inside the physical body, and the mind becomes the entire body. Then you're going to start going out into the world through all of your senses. And you're going to begin to get very important feedback. This is why I take away the electronic um, devices. So you can get this feedback from the world. But you're also giving energy. And what we need right now is an expanded range of what human energy entails. We've been so constrained by this rationality, this standardization, all the things that have affected us from the Industrial Revolution, all the implications of standardization, of norms, when in fact we're all very different and we all have something very important to contribute, but not alone as this interconnection. Both exercises that we did interconnect you. The first one to breathing, and you breathe the air in this room, so you're breathing each other's air. And then the second one connecting through the physical medium of your hands and the energy exchange that goes on and how important that is to all of us as a community if we're going to reinvent ourselves. So the emphasis on the individual and separateness is something I'm putting up on the shelf. That belongs to another era. It's relations, relations to the physical environment, the air around us, or relations to other human beings, other animals, the rest of the non-human world. Those relationships gives us the energy to expand, but we don't know what we're going to find. It's, it's the expansion into the unknown. And there's a nice um, uh, academic word for this. It's called tacit knowledge. All the things that you know that never can be verbalized. What would happen if we recognize that as at least as important to the things you can verbalize? And if, in fact, it may be much more important. So all the things that you know that you've taken in through your whole life, that if you lived from that place, would expand the range of your own possibilities, and by doing that, other people's possibilities. So this idea of, of waking up all your senses. Yes, you're listening to somebody talk. You're probably taking in visually who they are. But what about touch? What about smell? What about taste of this other relational being? What's, what are you learning? Let yourself recognize those things and see what kind of energy exchange there is. So that's um, part of what you can take away from this. But obviously, there's a lot more you could do if you were doing this with uh, patients or clients or other students. But the, the focus is, again, another Am I awake? 
what more can I do to wake up? Paying attention to my senses. How many senses do you use? How many senses are there? You know. <laughs> Five plus. Good for you. Yeah, that plus. Don't want to be get caught. <laughs> Five plus. That's right. That's the place to begin. Certainly, modern physiology talks about five. And Mark has been a Waldorf teacher. How many senses did Steiner, Rudolf Steiner say there were? Steiner says we have 12. 12. There's, oh, you look a little doubtful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that all? Well, one of my favorite novels is by a Chinese-American writer, um, Amy Tan. And it's a uh, hundred secret senses. She's Chinese-American, and part of the novel is in China, and describing sensory engagement in the world that just is mind-boggling. But you know how when something unexpected happens and you feel like your hair standing on end, like a dog's hair. I mean, just imagine if each one of those little hairs was taking in some piece of information out there. That's the way that book and the Chinese tradition of engagement in the natural world. And you could even take this a step further in, in expanding your sense of the world through discovery of what sensory input you might be able to receive if you opened yourself. That, in and of itself, is now being understood as absolutely vital to our life energy. Without contact with the non-human world, which is this engagement I'm talking about, not controlling, we can't be fully alive that there's such an interdependence, you could call it life force, that comes out of the non-human world, the more we layer ourselves away from it, which is this, again, where the constructed environment is so uh, much at fault, the deader we feel. So I'm not just talking about an aesthetic experience or isn't it nice to go to the beach. I'm talking about what feeds your life force contact with the non-human world. And again, I just invite you to spend some time reading, looking at YouTube presentations on neuroscience. They're just, it's extraordinary what's happening. So this exercise is to start that, okay, I'm waking up, but whoo, let me just be open. It's called open focus. And I want to make sure you understand I'm not talking about multi-focus. I remember, you know, you see, oh God, well, I'm watching a film, I'm listening to my favorite song, I'm talking to my best friend, and I'm doing my work for tomorrow. Not multi-focused. Because it's my contention that when you're focused in that way, leaping back and forth, you never know what you've missed from one of the devices or programs that's trying to communicate with you or people. So if you're sending an email and your favorite song is on, you're not conscious of more than that one thing because we're so trained in perspectival focus. So it's multi-focus, but you're moving around between it. What I'm talking about is open focus. So you, I'm not just focused on one, nor am I moving from one to one. I'm staying in one place, but I'm completely opening, even to the extent of knowing what's going on in back of me. So the best way to learn to do this is to learn to track. 
animals. Because if you go out very early in the morning and you sit, like up in a tree, or yes, I climb trees, I love trees, we have all kinds of messages. You sit up there, or sit on the ground and just sit, and then open everything up, all the animals moving around, people. I have never had this happen to me, but people I know, squirrel crawl up here. In other words, you're so still, but you're opening your focus. You're taking everything in. That's being engaged in the world. Not, and you can tell what's going on back here, eyes in the back of your head. So again, one exercise, but a doorway to this tacit knowledge. And that knowledge that you gain of the non-human world I would contend is you bring it back into your work as unexpressed verbally, but coming out through your hands, which are the medium that we overlap from our body into the world most frequently. So again, you want that knowledge. OK, so now we're going to have a third exercise, which Mark is going to lead. And Jeff will assist. Thanks. So we're going to put together this device, which Jean, Jeff, and I use frequently at Parsons. Which we invented. They invented. It's being perfected. <laughs> it's a very sophisticated device. Yes. Portable. I have to be able to tell we're studying that. It would be very useful when you, you can do it with your own um, groups. Down. Anybody come to guess what this is? Yeah. Besides the guillotine lying on the floor? <laughs> 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 if anybody's feeling sleepy, please stand up and stretch. Don't let yourself fall asleep just because you have to sit in a chair. What? <laughs> oh, that's, that's a good idea. <laughs> Jeff, do you want to push that? Yeah. Anybody else want to guess? Uh, walking the street oh, line. It gets harder and harder. Ooh. Ooh. So you got something you communicated from huh? Jeff to you. Can you pick it to you? That's funny. That's really funny. Oh, right. oh boy. Nice. She's got it. So maybe, we, maybe we should move. You all back just a little bit in case somebody. This is, this is a far more formal environment than we're used to doing it in. Yes. yes. <laughs> this is, this is, this is, um, so oh, yeah. The energy turns out energy because of the, the line is right. <laughs> so the objective is, is to walk across it. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> it's not necessarily to be successful and not to fall, it's to try to be in touch with the phenomenon of your breath, uh, what's going on in your middle section, what's going on in your whole um, vertical element as you are crossing it. And to encounter uh, your, your tipping points and what you do to notice those, what your body does, to bring yourself back into an upright position to avoid falling. So that's really kind of the journey from here to there. And um, I think Jean would like me to walk it, not because I'm particularly good at doing it, but just because the people who have done it without a model tend to kind of rush through in order to sort of just get it over with because everybody's watching them doing it and it's not embarrassing because I'm gonna fall. <laughs> So I'm going to try and do it in a mindful manner. And I may ask for assistance at some point, which you'll all be free to do also. Thank you. 
if you just stand here. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking Rachel to help me, and I'm just going to lean on her when I feel like I need to. So we invite the next person to take that little journey. By the way, I suppose you can guess what sense we're demonstrating after the five plus sense of balance. balance. Now we clearly have a sense of our balance. Apparently it's guided by the organ that's the inner ear. Um, we are so attuned to it that we um, quickly upright ourselves once we are out of balance. Um, we become very familiar with parts of buildings that are not level, um, etc. So, and I presume for your field, the whole sense of balance that's in your body um, transposes into becoming aware of psychological balance when your, your clients are in or out of balance. As, as architects and designers, we are always very aware of visual balance, tectonic balance, massing balance. So this, it all grows out of that connectedness um, with your, your own physical sense of balance and when you encounter tipping points and, and when not. So. Who would like to volunteer? We're not going to have time, unfortunately, for everybody to do it. But mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And would you like to have um, some spotters? <laughs> it's sometimes useful to take shoes off if that helps people. I might just stand on the end of the third edge just in case. Okay. Well, the floor might not be level. Right. The floor is never level. <laughs> it's one of the things you become very sensitive to. Going slowly, thank you, is very important. I'd like a spider. Good. Do you want to choose somebody? Uh, yeah, the person who just did it. <laughs> <laughs> Rub off some of her energy. <laughs> uh, this looks a lot harder. It, it looked much easier sitting down. <laughs> but do go slowly. It's harder and harder. <laughs>
Yeah, to be stressed that we, we don't, this isn't some kind of gotcha challenge we've been putting in front of the students. It's, it's just an attempt to get the students um, reacquainted with that gradual awareness of their ability to balance. You know, like if we just put a single beam in front of them, then it might be a bit more intimidating. But we devised this way to make it easier for them to just see how far they go and try to get reacquainted with that sense we all have with balance in motion. You know, this is something that's always moving, it's not static. And actually Jeff was the one that said, well, why don't we start with a little bit wider at this end. <coughs> at the beginning, when we first put down a 2x4, we just had the very thin, like you see, the last <laughs> section. And that's really difficult. But if you start here, then a person, like you said, it, you can start, but wow, it's very different than when you're looking at it. Anyone else want to give it a try? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, shoes, very important in terms of connecting the senses at the bottom of your feet to the world around you. you know, realizing what a wood floor feels like, how to fix your legs, and getting your feet out, letting them get stimulated. Do you want someone to walk next to you? That's fun. Yeah. Okay. The last person will say. It's <laughs> a good tradition. I'll see you. <laughs> of uh, Philippe Petit walking oh, yeah. eight yeah. times between the two World Trade Center towers. Eight yeah. times. And he gets out there and he has a bar and he starts jumping. I mean, something unbelievable happened near the end because he just was like full of joy. And you could see the airplanes circling around like, whoa. I mean, it is extraordinary. And this, this sense of balance that those of you who did this, it's that experience that's so important. Reinventing the human, regaining our balance in the universe. And you know, let's hope it's like Pierre Philippe, full of joy, just extraordinary. The combination of practice, practice, practice. He practiced. He had a dream. He was obsessed with the World Trade Center, made models of it you know, as it was being built. It was like his thing. Practice, practice, practice. But the key to practice is real life is always different. But the practice gives you that first step. And then you're, you have to trust. And that incredible joy that he expressed. I just, I can't get it out of my imagination. Just 
whoa, you know, I'm way up here and I'm throwing up the bar and I'm jumping. And I did it eight times. I mean, talk about not being in a hurry. You know, if I got across, I would stay to the other side. I mean, unbelievable. So the heart of it is balance is not static. Right before you are out of balance is the balance point. And you have to feel that to know that. So if you're working with a client or if you're designing something, that knowledge in your body is going to be tremendously important for you to draw on. Even though every situation you meet will never be the same as this. But you practice, practice. My favorite example, Mark and Jeff have heard it a hundred times. A few years ago, a man standing on the subway platform in New York City with his two young children and an NYU film student who's epileptic, has a fit, and falls on the tracks. And a train is coming into the station. So this man, with his two children, I still can't get over it, leaps onto the track, the train is coming in, grabs this student, lays him out between the tracks, and lies on top of him, and the train goes over them, and they both survive. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was just like, wah! So I said, how did he ever do that? Well, it turns out he was a Navy SEAL, but never ever would he have extra done a practice where he threw a body and has to measure. You know, if you look, I've now looked. The depth of the track versus the ground of the subway varies. You know, sometimes it's a little, sometimes it's a lot. He was also a construction worker, and he spent all his time trying to figure out what would go into this space. So he was constantly looking at a material object and a space, and will it fit or won't it fit. So practice never duplicates life, but practice builds a body knowledge that you can act from spontaneously. And that's what I find is less and less likely to happen. It's, people are numb because their bodies aren't awake. They haven't been feeding their senses. So we have all these like situations that we've never had before, and we're all numb. What can we do? So these three things, stretching, getting your mind, body, breath aligned. Do it as many times as you need with a session, or in a class, or yourselves. Shaking hands. In other words, physical, relating with another person, opening your senses, keying in, trusting them. Obviously, you're going to make mistakes. Somebody who you thought was gentle may turn out to be extremely rough. So you, then you have to correct. That's why you have experience, so you can adjust. Obviously, you're taking a risk. But you're learning. And then this final exercise, really having to be awake by walking this balance beam. And, and when we originally started, we just had this, right? So I mean, yeah, and, and two people standing at the end. Then the interesting ha thing started to happen that you saw here. People started asking for spotters. And all of a sudden, we realized people were learning how to collaborate through their visceral experience. And obviously, collaboration is part of this network, this idea that we're all connected. So that was like a surprise. We hadn't thought of it as a way to help students begin to understand that your body relationships are very important in collaborating. And also the stretching at the beginning of the class. After half a semester, the fact the students have to pay attention to each other when they're stretching, they start to be much more aware of themselves as a group. And then when we do group actions or installations, things out in the city, they're, the way they work together is just like amazes me. But you have to build up. Collaboration isn't just sitting at a table and suddenly, OK, we're all going to work together. 
So it keeps evolving. I don't know if you can add, do you want to add something more to what has come out of this? I would, I would just reinforce what you said, that, the, that the, when we extended, we actually extended the long single plank length from like four or five feet to this 10 foot length. Um, and it occurred to us it would be better for liability reasons to allow some spotting to go on. Um, and the notice, I mean, if you watch the person doing the spotting, you can see that agency. I mean, you can see the, the kind of physical empathy. Even if they're not being used, you can see that they're ready to be used and they can almost sense the other person's walking the, the, the thin bit. So um, it, was, it was really special to see students realizing that they were as engaged walking on the floor as the person who had much more challenge to walk on. Um, very simple, and it wasn't something we set up initially, but um, very clear once it started happening that, that uh, there was a social relationship there, there was a physical relationship there, there was a kind of collaborative relationship there. That was quite Mark, anything you want to No, add? I was just thinking that it, why is it such an interesting spectator sport? Like, I was actually, like, we were all really quiet watching them walk. I think it's because what's going on in here is, like, we, we, we know from our own sense of balance, whether we walk a beam or not, that <gasps> she's going to fall. What's it feeling like for her? It's, there's tension. There's suspense. No, I, I'd like to expand on that. I think that, that we're looking for how does someone identify and tune into center and how how do they do it how does mm. a person keep her balance um, we know how it feels but but we don't know how it works so that's what was mesmerizing for me in watching that you were getting the sense that how is she gonna s no i i was able to look at how mechanically keeping one's balance actually works mm especially the last person who walked yes. who was very still and and who who was able to to maintain very smoothly how does she do that i can't do that what can i see in in what she's doing that's very different from the way i am in my own body hmm. yeah there was something i don't know if it was me just me but the last walker i was also particularly mesmerized by for me, it was the stillness. Mm, maybe. I think that stillness is somewhat deceptive, though. What a lot of our conversations come back to um, when we're thinking about space and architecture and things, and, and we think that there's a, some kind of achieved stillness and symmetry, for example. But one of the things we keep coming back to is that that center is ever so subtly always shifting. I mean, and that's the marvel of the human mechanical body is that we can we can keep centering that center, and the center kind of keeps shifting, but we're still on top of it in some way. Um, which is, which is great to, to be able to rely on, that we can always deal with moving centers and, and still be OK somehow and, and right our way a lot. But those people who can embody that and make it look really still, I mean, that's, that's, that's incredibly difficult to do and, and uh, very impressive. Yeah. And what Carol and uh, Mark were talking about is empathy. In other words, being able to feel what another person is experiencing that particular relationship that what you described and what you described and why this particular person walking seems to have activated that well, for both of you. Neurologically, when you see someone doing something, there's, there's an echo in your own body. Well, this, what you went seemed even further than that, a real, you know, a real feeling of it. Yes, like the monkey who eats an ice cream cone because the lab assist it is. <laughs> that's, that's my favorite example of <laughs> mirror, mirror. OK, so it's almost 8 o'clock. I just want to quickly show you um, a class that is, uses a lot of these techniques. And it's required of all the junior undergraduates in the School of Architecture in the School of Constructing Environments. And it's called Nature, Culture, and Design. And the idea is to find a balance between these three, because obviously they're designing, and they're human, they're part of nature, and they all have cultural background. So balance is tremendously important between these three demands. And as I mentioned, 
we tend to be a very distracted, out of the body, out of our heads uh, culture. So these are just images of students in the top. That was in a big lecture course, and they were in the back row. And catching how most people in the back row inhabit their bodies. They're distracted. They're not paying any attention. They're looking the other way. I mean, there's almost a correlation in an auditorium between who sits in the front as paying attention and the people in the back are not attentive. So this possibility that our habits of how we inhabit ourselves and our body, our attention, is the disjunct between ourselves and what I'm calling eco-literacy, which is now being uh, is now a requirement of all graduates of Parsons School of Design that they need to be eco-literate. So they need to know that their own body is an ecological system. And how they inhabit their body is how they inhabit the world and how they'll be inhabiting uh, the designs they're making. So calling their attention to the multi-forms of consciousness and how they're related. The center one is what you eat, going to the farmer's market, eating local food. We all know what it means in terms of energy consumption, the sustainability of the region. But there's also the way in which if you eat from a place, you start to be of that place. Because you're eating the soils, the minerals, the water that grew the vegetables that you are eating. So this connection to place through what you put in your body also, dreaming, the importance of dreaming as another form of consciousness and how it's, that's affected by what you eat and also musing. Just, we need space. We need to slow down that pause between all of the distractions may be the space out of which new ways of being human can emerge. So waking up the senses, we went from the five senses to the kinesthetic. And taking what you learn about balance and walking here, one of the things that Mark does with architecture students is, OK, when you walk through the city, you're out in the city. How is your walking engaging you in the city around you, the kinesthetic sense, and the connection between the foot and the brain and the <laughs> knowledge that you get? Oops, sorry. So the hand becomes a center of this course that because for all of us, the hand is the medium through which we work with the world. Whether you're on a computer or you're working with clay. And the interesting thing is that many people think we don't use our hands anymore. So a reaction that we get often when we are teaching this class is, oh, Gene, you know, you're just from another era. We don't use our hands anymore. We're on computers all the time. And then they go, ooh, ooh. So the hand, as this tactile grasping of the world and the importance of what you do with your hands. So playing, these are uh, field trips I've taken with students out to the East River. And you know, there were things we were supposedly doing, but they had their own ideas and began playing. Whoops, I've got to get this right. So then students, obviously, throughout your own whole life, you're grasping the world with your hands. And then your hands are making. So what's the difference when your hands, like the young women up in there in the corner, are working with paper and materials and wire, and somebody working on a computer this student is drawing on a transparent acetate uh, sheet. So what's the difference of how we make an interface when we're on an electronic device as opposed to the one-to-one -one tactile variety of all the materials that the students are using up in the corner? 
what are our hands knowing now and how does that affect our making? So I'm uh, convinced by research that says what our hands do shape the brain. So if children are spending more and more time early and earlier with electronic devices, then that means the neural pathways in their brains are going to be shaped by pushing or you know, touching a uh, iPad, which is very different than you know, all the other forms of hands. Those are hand marks up uh, on the caves. That what we do with our hands shapes the brain and the evolution of it. So our brains are not set. So the brains of young children who spend a lot of time with electronic toys, the neural pathways are very different than those children who grew up without the computer. So the question I asked the students, and Jeff has been doing it with me for two years, and Mark will do it next year, is where are you evolving given the things you're doing with your hands? And you know, obviously, this is very biased. But at this time of, you know, starting at mid-semester, this is the way most of the students look that I know in the studio. You know, they're not breathing, they've got back aches, they're sitting in front of their computer, they've got bug eyes. So what we do is at mid-semester, after the students have been making regularly drawings of their hands and we've been giving them exercises to think about their hands as a cultural object, think about it as a, you know, having your childhood embedded in it. So every other week they did drawings. Here's, you know, somebody seeing their hand turn into plugs and wires and keyboards. And this person, it's hard for you to see, but their joint is like drawing a city into their arm. And the other one is looking at the trying to understand there are thousands of nerve endings in your hands. So they've been looking and studying their hands. And then at mid-semester, we say, OK, everyone has to learn a new hand skill between now and the end of the semester. And keep a journal of it and give us a demonstration at the end of the semester. So then you know, starts a lot of scurrying around. And keeping the journal. For instance, the hand uh, on the right, the student decided to learn to cook. So then looking at her hand in relationship to cooking, how is your hand involved in cooking? And there are even people who argue that your hand coming in contact with living materials, vegetables, grains, that that is a communication of energy. It's not just when you eat the food. It's the contact with the living food, cutting it, slicing it, cleaning it. You're in contact, like you know, like carrot from the uh, farmer's market. The smells. I mean, the sensory involvement in the preparation. So this student trying to understand what parts of our hands are now being activated compared to a computer. So they keep a journal. They watch what they're doing. And then we have a big party at the end of the semester. And this is instead of the classic art student's critique. It's a huge party. And uh, the big room in our department, you're all welcome to come next fall at the end of the semester. <clears throat> and students put up little, like they make little stations for themselves around the um, room. And here, a student has designed all the clothes that you see those four young women wearing and made them out of recycled materials and dyed them with earth dyes. And he's giving a demonstration to the rest of the students. And this particular student, Chinese American, learning tai, learned Tai Chi. And we invite family, friends, that's the head of our department, so it's a real party. And, and the people who come go around to each student and talk with them, have a demonstration. We don't have just one student showing everybody. So there's all this activity. This, this particular young woman from India 
was uh, reading people's hands. And she was tremendously popular. <laughs> and you can see that the student enjoys it. But this is in six weeks. And they have to pick something they don't know how to do, but they've always wanted to do. Oops, sorry, can't get this right. And I encourage them to pick something from their own cultural background. So this was a Japanese student who'd always wondered about those shoes. You know, why women walked around on those shoes. So they have to do a historical study of the skill they want to learn and you know, really understand what it is, plus learn how to make it. So he made those shoes. And they make posters of the various stages of making it, but also learning about the history, which is learning about their own culture. And I encourage them to think about something that really fired up their imagination when they were about 12 or 13. This is a student from Puerto Rico, but I'm, I'm pretty sure her family actually are, is from Cuba. But in a village in Puerto Rico, there's an annual festival. We have these masks and dancing. So she made the masks. She investigated what the dancing was all about. And what this behind this is the uh, possibility that when you're about 12 or 13, what your hands are instinctively interested in doing is often very connected what you personally have to contribute to the world. So you might call it your fate. And I recommend a book called The Hand by Frank Wilson. He's a neurologist I've worked with, and a lot of this neurological thinking comes from his work. He has studied and talked with and interviewed people who are virtuosos in many fields. And again and again, it goes back to somebody when they were like 12 or 13 encouraged what they wanted to do, not made them sit in a classroom and you know do exactly what the teacher was doing. But if they wanted to do whatever it was, make clay objects, plant trees, whatever it was that they're they were really interested in doing with their hands and eventually becoming very good. Not necessarily in exactly what they did at 12 or 13, but it's connected. And people learn, like I said, Jeff being so involved with music. We had someone two years ago who went out and bought a saxophone. But the wonderful thing is they would try and practice after studio. So you'd go up there, and they'd all be having a jam session, trying to learn musical instruments, teach each other. <clears throat> this young woman, very involved in Bloomberg's now plant a million trees. She did all kinds of uh, planting projects. And the best of all is the food. There are always some students who want to learn what their grandmother could cook. Alban up there, he's from the south. His family's been in the south for maybe 200 years. And he took fruit from fruit trees that his great grandfather had planted and made jams. And Jackie, her family's Italian, she made ceram tiramisu for everybody. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So they really put themselves into it. And it's, it's, it's such an amazing thing, because teaching yourself and doing something new with your hands is not only waking your hands up, but it's showing you how, how you can be flexible. You can be resilient. You need to learn something new. You learn it. You're not just glued into a particular, like you were saying, move from one modality to another. I'm sort of hurrying, hurrying, but I want Jeff, I want you to show the exercise that we start off. Yeah, just give them one exercise. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> Very quickly, um, we, uh, uh, you know, the architecture students traditionally would be very used to using a lot more of their body than they do now. They'd be bent over drafting tables and using arms and shoulders, but not so these days. It's usually maybe just one of their hands, doing a lot of left clicking and right clicking. Um, so I always expect this exercise to be pretty smooth and easy for most of these students. They didn't have a lot of finger strength, but it's just kind of interesting. Um, you guys are probably all smartphone users, so you'll probably have pretty good finger strength. But if you just hold up your hands with me, I'll just show you what we do sometimes at the beginning of class. Um, kind of shake out your fingers a bit. Um, but we'll just go through and just try to feel each finger's kind of independent, you know, autonomous existence. So if you just put your fingers together, all of them, um, and now if you just go through, uh, let's say, moving the index finger in and out, 
Um, it's pretty easy. It's a finger we use a lot, right? Um, and we can move maybe to the pinky, the outside of that one, in and out, just to make it moving out. Um, then I guess we go with whatever the Spock one is, uh, um, splitting the middle two. Um, and maybe moving like the middle finger back and forth between Mark, you struggling over there? Thank you for pointing me out, Jeff. <laughs> um, the hard one, of course, is the next one is moving the, the ring finger between the pinky and the middle finger. Right? Does everybody still feel their fingers at this point? And you probably all feel right now, I mean, and there are many more we could do, but you're probably all feeling in your forearms, like yeah. what is that concrete yeah. now in my forearms? And that's just whatever that was, 12, 15 seconds or something. Um, but this kind of, you can shake out your fingers by all means. Um, this is just a few examples, but the, the, the realization, of course, is that we're using our fingers all the time, but we're quite absently using them. We're touching a surface that doesn't give much back, oftentimes, in these smartphones and things. Um, we're losing a lot of our tactile kind of interface, uh, and even with just a mouse, just, just those two clicks and a scroll wheel, um, it's amazing how divorced we're becoming from our fingers. My own training and background is in guitar building, um, so I've, I've done a lot of, a lot of aches and pains and nicks and scars from that, but also a lot of you know, wakefulness has to be there so you don't lose a finger. Um, but it's something to, to get any type of student um, reacquainted with, is that, that, those, that those fingers, a lot of times, we don't have very much control of them when we want to, but yet we use them all the time. It's just what is that gap? Because I feel like if we get back into that gap, pay a little more attention, um, we, we become a bit more attentive to these other possibilities. And, and certainly the exercise of the new hand skill and genes class uh, has been a really successful way to wake up students. And it reminds them what they wanted to do, what they want to be able to do, uh, and, and then certainly gets their hands moving. And then once you have an engaged um, kind of practice, which is to a larger goal, uh, the hands will wake up. They'll, they'll come right to it. And, and it's amazing how we would do this a number of times throughout the semester, and people will start to get that, some of those weirder movements. They'll start to get them just after trying it for a little while. Um, and I'll just Except for Jean. Jean really does get there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> My hands have done different things. So I'll just leave you with one final question to think about. Like Jeff was saying, you're all of a sudden you're starting to feel beyond your wrist. Where does your hand begin and end? So just, that would be not to be answered, just to be thought about. So that's it. So thank you all. I kept you a little bit late. And if you have some questions, oops, I'm, we're happy, but I know it's afterwards. Go ahead. Can you please wait for the mic? Hi, thank you very much for this. this is really interesting. I teach um, at Parsons as well. I teach fashion history and I teach online. Mm. And so a twofold question I have, and maybe this is really specific, but maybe you can say some general things that would apply to other, th to other people as well. Uh, how to bring more of a bodily engaged experience to online teaching. This is something I'm mulling over mm. all the time. And trying to make it more multi-dimensional for the students and also teaching something like fashion history, which if you think of how we even teach art history or these survey courses where you're just sitting in these big rooms, clicking through slides that are visually stunning, but you're just, there's not, I, I think the way we teach history also is kind of deadening. <laughs> so I'm always looking for ways to like, bring history alive, and also um, the online experience, how to make it more dynamic and physically engaged if possible. So I don't know if you have any Well, a colleague and I wrote a that. book called Cinemetrics, Brian McGrath and myself. And the purpose of it is to recognize what a computer can do as opposed to a slide projector, for mm -hmm. instance, and also to make us really focus on the fact that the sensory motor skills, which is what we've been talking about in a fancy way, that a computer activates are very different than the physical world. So what we did was we um, introduced every aspect of what we were doing on the computer with a in the real world exercise first. So in your case, if your students are 
in other, you know, spread across the world. Thinking of fashion history related, something they could do where they live. You know, something that they could bring back, that understanding of whether it's, you know, finding the actual material of something that you want to talk about historically, but something that ties what you're looking at digitally to something physical and then and really making that part of what you're doing. Yeah, Carol, you have some thoughts? I, I wanted to reply to that. Um, I used to wear a lot of vintage clothes, huh? um, really vintage clothes, like mid-19th century clothes. Um, and for me, that physical experience um, told me something about that, that time that I couldn't get in, in any other way. Um, not even so much the reproduction reenactment as the, the, the way a garment binds on one part of your body or frees another part of your body that makes you begin to move in a different way and then you find yourself thinking in a different way and then you have a different historic and cultural insight through your body than you would have in another way. So you might consider asking your students to do some exercises with, uh, for instance, binding something tightly around the, their midsection um, or something So you know, you like could that. just rewrite. I mean, this is the challenge. Electronics is not the same as the printing press. The lecture hall and the book come out of a different era. So you're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, and that's the fun yeah. that, um, you know, and the things that you're saying that you learn. I mean, and that's the other thing. The internet, the exchange of knowledge can be so quick, and knowledge is not any longer something individual, but, you know, starting some kind of um, collective effort. Let's rewrite fashion history and see who comes in and what they contribute. and. Because you know, I agree with you. I think all those things, it's not just another book and another lecture. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm a physician, and I, I'm, after 50 years, I'm appalled that they have to introduce touch back into the profession now <laughs> and teach students to touch their patients. But I had recently mm. had this really wonderful experience. Uh, a very dear colleague of mine and other people died recently, but he had written some learning plays that were for the American Psychological Association. And we had a reading of these plays that are very, very rich in terms mm. of theory. And, and then what we discovered was the thing that what everybody said was the most helpful in learning the learning, what the learning plays were talking, was to perform it. And I was wondering what you thought about that, because just the, there were readings, they weren't, you know, but the performance of the word <laughs> in that way had such an experience to learn the, what the, what the play was, actually. Mark, had, with his it. Steiner background, he might jump in there. Yeah, well, we did theater all the time with the students. The students were always had theater, a play every year, mm -hmm. um, because it's a way of letting them, you know, free themselves with their colleagues and their peers. So. Letting themselves what? Just feel freer okay. to be a different person, mm -hmm. who you are, um, and interact with a person you may never interact with, um, on a, and become friends that way through role play. Can you elaborate on this Steiner? Wow, that's a big, that's a okay. big topic. I can do, I'll talk to it, you about it, but okay. I'm not sure. I want to keep everybody here for that. But the interesting thing about Rudolf Steiner and so many of the practices that involve the body that were rolfing, yoga, so many of them 
actually took their form out of a reaction to urbanization in the 19th century. So the idea that we are being distanced from our bodies by urbanization very much was on the mind of the 19th century. Henri Bergson, for instance, great discussions of, that's where I got this term sensory motor of what's happening without the contact to nature. So going back to these individuals and these practices for me has been very, very important because they were addressing in an earlier form what we're experiencing now, this complete disengagement from our bodies from the natural world. And they were making a very concerted effort to keep that connection alive. So I recommend, like yoga, lots of us think yoga is 5,000 years old. Well, there's only one yoga asana in the literature. Most of it's 19th century. It's, it's practices that English tutors in the Indian courts developed because they're the young uh, princes and princesses in India were no longer physically involved in the environment. So chaturanga is basically a push-up that an English tutor introduced into yoga. So yoga is very much a 19th century mixture of European gymnastics and uh, a slow evolving of a few asanas from India. My point being, these are living traditions. And I think we've got much to add. Now that you've got the computer, what can you do physically with your bodies to get your students to really do more than just identify the date and the person who made it and you know the old art history thing? Any other questions, thoughts? Well, thank you all for. 20 after 8. We're staying up late. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thanks, everybody, for being here for the series. And just one last word about embodiment. Creative arts therapy is really a movement that is getting people back into their bodies, into their hearts, and into their relatedness with other people. So if you're looking for more techniques and ideas and concepts in the, along those lines, come and join us for some of our classes. That's what they're all about. What are your classes? Where? I missed the beginning. Creative arts therapy classes. We have a certificate program here at the new school, and that's what this program is uh, coming out of the creative arts therapy certificate program, which is music, art, dance, and drama therapy.